All right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks to those who are coming back and also to those who are coming for the first time. Uh, my name is Maggie and I'm a consultant with Christina T. Miller Sustainable Jewelry Consulting. And um, we provide strategy, guidance and education on responsible sourcing and sustainability in the jewelry industry. Uh, we can share our website if you're not familiar with us and you'd like to find out more, you can check that out. And so, um, you know, I know many of you are very familiar with the living room sessions. For some of you, it's your first time. So if you're not familiar, um, these are um, informal virtual hangouts. They're really meant to be a conversation where we can all learn and connect um, and support this kind of community that we need to make change in this space. So we cover different topics every month um, and we always love to hear from you guys in terms of what you wanna be hearing about, um, the type of guests you'd like to listen to or meet and um, anything else you'd like to explore. So um, thanks for coming to this conversation and a special thank you to those who have contributed to the pay what you want option. Um, we are so happy to be able to provide these sessions and make this information accessible. So um, thank you for supporting that. Just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we are recording and this video is gonna be posted publicly. So anyone is welcome to speak up. Um, just keep in mind that it will be recorded and publicly available. And if you're not speaking, uh, please stay muted. If you are private messaging somebody, please keep it kind. Um, and if you have a question or comment you wanna share, you're welcome to put it in the chat or let Christina or I know kind of that you wanna come on camera and contribute. Um, we're going to share also the form to subscribe to our email list. Um, we notice that there's some people that actually aren't on our list. And so if you wanna uh, kind of stay up to date with our takeaways from these sessions, and find out about future sessions, you can sign up there. I'll just throw that in the chat. Um, and lastly, our next living room session is going to be in August. We are taking June and July to focus our energy in other ways. Um, it's been a long year, <laughs> it's been a tough year for many of us and um, many parts of the world are still grappling with um, the realities of COVID. And so we just think everybody could use a break <laughs> and there are plenty of webinars and opportunities to learn going on right now. So we will be back in August and um, we can't wait to see you guys again then. And I wanna give one little special birthday shout out to Alix, Alexandra Hart. It's her birthday today. <laughs> Thanks for spending your birthday with us and learning. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about radical jewelry makeover. We're joined uh, by a special guest, uh, a friend of Christina's for many years, um, and an accomplished artist. Um, so Susie Gonch is with us today, and I'm going to read Susie's bio. We'll also share the links uh, to her bio so you can read more. And Susie is an accomplished artist whose artwork effectively triangulates jewelry, sculpture and activism as a means to process some of our most complex material relationships. She's an associate professor in the metal area lead in the Department of Craft and Material Studies at VCU School of the Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Her work has been included in exhibitions at museums around the world, including the Smithsonian Museum for Women in the Arts, MFA Boston, the Design Museum in London, and many others. She currently has a solo exhibition at Penland School in North Carolina. And part of Susie's practice is directing Radical Jewelry Makeover, which is an international jewelry mining and recycling project that continues to travel across the country and abroad. Since 2007, Susie has wor been working closely with ethical metalsmiths because of this project, which serves in, as an outreach arm of the organization. She's also been working on the board of uh, ethical metal smiths since 2014 when it was formed. And we're also joined by RJM co-director Kathleen Kennedy. If you want to give a wave, Kathleen. Kathleen is an adjunct, uh, adjunct instructor and metal arts area coordinator for the Department of Craft and Material Studies at VCU. She's a member of the advisory council for, council for ethical metal smiths and currently serves as co-director of Radical Jewelry Makeover. 
She is an artist, jeweler, and participated in the first RJM ever in 2007 at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we are supported by a few other special guests today, Adriana Moll and Curtis Arima. So we'll be hearing more from them soon. I'm going to copy the link in for the Radical Jewelry Makeover website so you guys can check it out. It's a really awesome project and we're excited to share this with you today. So if you've heard of Radical Jewelry Makeover, feel free to let us know. If you've ever participated in one, uh, let us know, let us know which one, when and where. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Christina. So this is such a huge pleasure. Um, it's a bit uh, indulgent here before we take the next two months off of um, doing these living room sessions. And um, it's indulgent and it is an absolutely clear line from our recycled living room session a couple of months ago to this particular project. So if you're not aware already, Radical Jewelry Makeover is, you know, it has a number of ways of being described, right? A community mining project, a jewelry recycling project, a community mining project, right? It has all these sort of different ways to think about it. But we spend a ton of energy um, thinking about the beginnings of jewelry. We think about where do we source our original materials? We think about the impacts that that sourcing has. We'd spend tons of time developing designs that are inspired and are wearable and are desired by other people. Um, but rarely do we really think about the end of that piece of jewelry. So in sustainability practice, looking at the entire life cycle of um, a piece of jewelry is really important because at every point along the cycle of that piece, um, there's work to be done to improve on impacts. Um, so when it comes to the end is a very much where in a way radical jewelry makeover starts um, because it relies on existing pieces that exist in a community's collection. So those jewelry boxes, those little bowls that you randomly have objects in and you have one earring left in there because you lost the other one or whatnot, those become kind of the source materials for radical jewelry makeover. So the way we would like, we've talked with Susie extensively on how we'd like to run this. Um, we really want this to be a conversation. So we'll, challenge each other with questions, we'll challenge you with questions, and we really hope that this is a session where you feel comfortable speaking up. And especially um, Curtis, long participant in RJM, and Adriano about to host a radical jewelry makeover in Brazil, the first in Latin America. And Kathleen, um, please speak up, you know, as you notice things are inspired to say something. So at this time, I would love to hear Susie get us started on um, some of the changes that have occurred to Radical Jewelry Makeover over the years. You know, we started it together in 2007. Um, you've long been directing and then Kathleen has joined you. And when I talk about what you've learned over the years, um, it's taken place in various communities. Um, the types of materials and the way they're handled have been expanded to reflect responsible thinking has evolved in the way jewelry is made. So tell us a little bit more about the project and in particular, what's shifted about it over time? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, maybe uh, it uh, for people that don't know about, well, first, let me, mm, I'm jumping in without saying thanks. Thanks. <laughs> this is a totally cool opportunity. I'm, I'm pretty excited to have this conversation. Um, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for being here. 
so maybe it would be important to back up all the way to when we started the project, like how it's different from that moment, right? Like when we when we started the project, we really had this impulse, right? Like we were like, holy cow, as teachers, um, the bins of waste were big, right? Like in our in our classrooms, we were like, holy cow, there's so much waste that we alone are generating. And we were like, and also, where is all this stuff coming from? Like we were just um, curious. We started off with this curiosity, curiosity of how we could shift the way that we were getting stuff and making stuff, right? I mean, it was this quick impulse and we wanted to actually um, do a rapid project that would just jumpstart people's minds. Like it was quick. We, we ran in, we, we deconstructed, well, we kind of collapsed all of the classes that when we took over uh, VCU's metal program, beginners were working with uh, seniors. We had no class schedule. We just put on the board every day what we were going to do. We're going to do these demos. We are going to sort the material. We're going to work this way. Like Kathleen was in the room at the time. She was a beginner student. And, and the students literally stopped sleeping and stopped attending any class. Like we quickly realized that it was the most interesting thing <laughs> that the students and we were doing, right? It was the most important thing we were doing. It was fun. It was uh, investigative. It was um, it was energizing. And when when RJM left, when the exhibition was over, the students, uh, it was like a hangover in the room, right? Where everyone was like, can we do that more? And that's when we realized that we had something going where we, it, it was like, um, Flintstones vitamins, they're tasty, yum. I'll take as many as you want me to, right? Like we, and so uh, Christina and I quickly realized that, holy cow, we have, a, we have a platform where we could do something with this and we could interrogate where materials are coming from. We could slip the bitter vitamin into the delicious project, right? And so over the years that has changed where, um, you know, the first, actually, I think, uh, Curtis, you were at the RJM that we did in California, where we had our, we filled an auditorium with people. Like we realized also the project itself made people curious, right? So all of a sudden we could fill an auditorium with an audience and we had this captive audience. Ooh, another place to put the bitter vitamin in, right? So the project has changed and maybe I should define bitter vitamin. What is that? That means that we had an opportunity to actually talk about this fun project that brings community together. It, it puts a call to action donation drive into a community where we uh, invite people to go and dig out that jewelry box for that class ring they stopped wearing decades ago, the earring that they don't have a pair for, the chain that broke, all of those things. It makes it fun. Send us the Mardi Gras beads too while you're at it and the buttons that you don't want anymore. All of it. We'll just take it, right? The watch you don't like. So, um, and then those folks loved uh, coming to the exhibition at the end and saying, oh my God, that's that crazy brooch I donated. It looks so cool now, right? So fun. It, it was fun and uh, um, it was um, non-controversial. But yet we had this opportunity where we could uh, put information in that we were learning about um, our field and where materials were coming from. And we could interrogate that system, right? And give information about how we might do things better. OK, so over the years, that has evolved to to include um, a technical list of ways you might work with material that consider the future. So it, it we started questioning, well, heck, if if I'm making a piece of jewelry now, it could come back into the RJM pile. So I would like to do this with grace. So when it comes back to the pile it can be easily and readily used. So that, that came uh, with a list of how we might use the materials. We also started um, 
creating a symposium at the beginning because again, we could fill an auditorium with curious people, right? And, and so it has changed. We also started interrogating the stories behind the jewelry and putting that forward as an impulse for why we make things, why we keep things, examining our hoards, right? Creating um, a system for looking at that. We also have a structure for how, you know, and we, and we systematize this. We developed a structure for how materials are sorted and how a donor is credited for the coupon based on reuse value, not on how pretty it is, but on how useful it is. And so all of that really evolved. Um, I know I'm rambling, but does this answer your question, Christina? Like, is, that a, is this how you wanted? Is this, is this good? I don't want to dominate, but. Uh, you're awesome. So it's all good. Um, for sure. I was wondering, though, it might be a good time to just share a couple of images because it will, you might step through it. And if Kathleen wants to help kind of explain just some of the basics of the process, it's I think it might be really interesting for folks to see what's donated, like what, why do people and then the conversation is kind of why do people choose the things that they choose to donate from their collections? So mm -hmm. I have a you... quick question, just okay. based on the last thing Susie was saying, um, the credits for um, giving material is based on how reusable they are. Yeah, and absolutely. This is to incentivize the having more long lasting items or how, how is that determined? Yeah, it's uh, it's such a great question, Maggie. Like you know, in my um, in my in my mind, I think, uh, gosh, could RJM change the world just based on how we educate people, right? Like, so if if somebody gives us a bag of donated material and they're like, oh, I love this stuff, and they get a five percent credit towards a made over piece at the end that 5% is because it was all costume jewelry. It's all made from uh, low melting metal or plastic or uh, plated things that have no value in our system, right? They're brittle, they'll, they'll, the plating comes off the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In our minds, we're thinking, well, that's interesting because then maybe somebody would think, oh, why is that material not valuable, right? Um, whereas if somebody gives us a diamond ring that has a hundred percent reuse value in our economy. And so we can credit it based on the day's rate of that material. And that to us is, oh, sorry, I have ants and I just had an ant on me. Um, and to, it, oh, you sorry. go Kathleen. Is that okay? Um, I think it's one more way that radical jewelry makeover can kind of insert itself and radically redefine our uh, value system, our economy in a way, right? To instead of just looking at the design or um, maybe uh, emotional value of something, we're looking strictly at the uh, material value or the reuse value of something for us. And then that also translates at the end when the work is made we're, we're pricing on design and transformation and not solely on the material value of something that was used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and then jumping in, um, Christina's question made me think, you know, to share an anecdotal story of when we were, when we sort things, first everyone should know when we sort things, we touch every piece of jewelry that comes in because we wanna make sure that uh, we understand what it is and it goes in the right categorized pile, right? So it takes time and it takes a lot of care. Um, and what it sh has shown us over the year years is that, um, the materials used to make jewelry are mixed up in people's minds and in the jewelry box. So for instance, like in, in uh, the New Mexico project, I know Christina will remember this, that um, in a bag of jewelry uh, given to us by a family who had just lost their mother, they packed it all up, they threw it in a bag and they mailed it to us. Um, there was costume jewelry and in there was a single earring 
that had 10 diamonds and uh, it was a gold cushion um, clip on earring with 10 diamonds. And we had an appraiser volunteering that day. And he was like, you know, this earring is about $10,000 worth of material. And I was like, mm, I don't think that person knew that. Right. I mean, that's how uh, it, it shows us something. It shows us how people see material or how how they view what goes into something or how they're categorizing things. Right. Um, I mean, just to finish that story, uh, I called uh, everyone that donates. Has, there's a donation form. You fill it out. You can tell the story about the material. But we also have your contact information. And then I called the person and they were like, oh, no. We did not know, and they wanted it back, so we mailed it back to them. But it, you know, it 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 is an important thing that everything has to get touched and everything has to get looked at in order to see what might potentially uh, become of it. Did that help, Christina? Yeah, I wanted to um, unpack one little bit of that a little bit further, and that's um, one of the. One of the questions in culture is when can an object, like who kind of has the right to obliterate the existence of an object? And because with the cancellation of that object, you also are then canceling, you know, the designer of that in a way, you're canceling the production that went into that in a way, you're canceling all of the design work that went into it in a way. And so, um, We've had questions with Radical Jewelry Makeover about like, well, wh why do you get to melt that piece down? And there have been situations where donations have been made, like the example Susie gave of really high value material, where the choice was made to return that to the family because they didn't know. In other cases, there have been donations of um, really uh, fine artist made jewelry you know, that are part of the Society of North American Goldsmiths community, for instance. And um, that, and it was donated by a collector, right? These pieces, the collector thought this would be an interesting way to send the pieces that, you know, she didn't want anymore into the world in a new way, but it presented a bit of an ethical dilemma for a radical jewelry makeover. So Susie or um, Kathleen or, or who, like, what's the filter, you know? So the, the donor fills out the donation form. I'm gonna to go to that image. The donor goes to the form. I think it's coming up there and they fill it out. So what does that give you? You know, when the donor is participating in the decision to end the life of that piece of jewelry. Wait, say that question again, sorry. So what, is the question? what role does, you know, does the, is the donor the one that has the permission to decide, you know, when they fill out the form, is it they're, they're the ones giving permission to end the life or give it a new one? Well, certainly I, they're the first, right? They're the first, they're the first chain in that, in this process of figuring out what is going to be, um, what is going to happen to their jewelry, right? They've decided they're ready to get rid of it. And, and we take it off their hands. And if you read the fine print on that donation form, it says that we will smash it, we will melt it, we will do anything we want to that material. But then um, there is a consensus driven decision making that happens in the process. Like we, it, we are a collaborative. So when we go into a community, um, every participant in the room decides. Right. Or and I have to say, sometimes I personally, I've decided like when um, my student Cassie son was cutting apart a Ramon Pooge, I pulled it out of her hand and said, that's uh, that looks like something I should look at. I repaired it. <laughs> you can't tell. Uh, and and it's ready for secondary market. So we also feel that we're shepherds uh, of a material of something that has value still for culture, right? That's not to say that Ramon Pooja's necklace won't find its way back into RJM at some point, and then we have to evaluate that again. Um, 
but I, I think that's an interesting consideration. I mean, Kathleen, you had something to say, so jump in. Oh, I was just gonna uh, echo that it's really a community decision, right? Like, yes, the donor is the one that makes the first decision that we can cut this up through donating it and filling out this form, but then it enters the sorting process and whoever's sorting in that small group first asks the first question of, wait, should I pull this out? Should I ask a question about this? should this be considered by the larger group or does it go on to the next part and continue to be sorted either into the costume pile or the um, precious materials pile but it it's touched by so many hands that eventually it's asked by the larger community is this something worth saving or something to continue to cut up and i think additionally mm -hmm. too like not everything is necessarily fully uh, fully exploded or taken apart, right? Like there are some really interesting design decisions that happen when there is that remnant of the original piece in the new piece that, that comes forward, right? Like how does that inspire the new work that's made in a way? Right, I mean, like for instance, when um, Boris Bally's brooch was cut apart by Sarah Holden, you could still see the remnants of Boris Bally's brooch. Or when uh, Meg Arsinovic cut uh, added to Claire Sanford's uh, cement uh, donut brooch, it it and it was great. You know, they become collaborations. But I will also say. Um, something that has tickled my mind uh, over the years is um, the idea of an artist not not wanting something to be heirloom or passed down. Like that's something that I I really investigate in my own work. Like that as I'm aging, my work is aging. When I die, maybe my work will die too. And that I don't I don't want to leave. Um, this pile of things like this evidence of my ego from my lifetime so it's something that i really think about i have to say like uh and to push on that in my own practice i mean with rjm i hope that it it brings those kinds of ideas to people that participate in the project and maybe this would be a moment to hear from curtis like because i know that curtis you have gone on to actually um work and make over jewelry in your practice, right? And and these pieces are such great evidence, I mean, that are up on the screen. Like, I'm curious how you think about this idea of heirloom and who gets to say when your work is melted down or not, right? Like, how do you think about it? Yeah, that's so interesting. And one of the, I've just put it in the chat. Um, one of the amazing things about radical jewelry makeover is that it it kind of forces people to think about ethics and sustainability in a way that is um, confronting, but not, uh, but engaging and not um, frightening. You know, people don't necessarily want to engage. Some people don't necessarily want to engage in these conversations. And through jewelry and uh, process and making it, it allows people to enter into these conversations really fluidly. And it's pretty amazing. So, um, forgot where I was going with that, but um, uh, to talk about my practice and how it's integrated into my practice, it's changed it so radically. Um, uh, participating in the Radical Jewelry Makeover with Christina and Kathleen and Susie in particular um, was um, an amazing experience that uh, allowed my students to engage in the idea of sustainability and the environment quite a bit more um, than they had before and really changed our program to think about that regularly. Um, and it's changed my studio practice. Um, now I do a lot of recycling of other people's materials and um, making new pieces for them. So um, it, 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 they have a, a kind of memory of those materials. Oftentimes it's old jewelry that they no longer wear or is broken. And I remelt it down and uh, make them pieces that they will wear. Sometimes it's a simple band that was their parents or something they inherited. So it, it takes that, um, that heirloom and transforms it into a new heirloom um, that carries that memory of, their, uh, of the history that the material had before. You know, I love what you said. Uh, something that you said made me think about this too, that one of the important um, 
missions of the project is that we're not providing right answers, right? Like we're only providing information. So on top of the fact that, you know, like we're trying to put in some some of the the bitter we're masking the bitterness with the sweet and we there's this fun project it's community building all of these things we we also are not there's no this is not a dictatorship of right answers right because if, if you've been attending the living room sessions or all of the webinars that are out there it's like you got to find your path right you have to find what the answer is or the ways that your practice uh functions um your own truth, right? Yeah. And so it's it, fluid. I think it helps bring those questions up, though, for people who don't necessarily think about them, you know, questioning the value of pieces, questioning how people interact with that value, um, how cl uh, clients think about their jewelry, how artists think about their jewelry, how all of, all of those individuals think about materials and how to use materials and, um, and how they affect the environment and that amazing um, kind of feedback loop of materials that RJM is making that's insular is really interesting to, to, to think about of how, how, how the cycle of our materials live in, in the jewelry world, but then that even bridges outside of how we just use materials in our day-to-day day -day life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So something, something else that I think is interesting, uh, because we've done this project, um, we, I haven't been in, involved for a while, so I should be careful how I say that, but, um, you know, the first most distant place it went to was Australia, right? Um, it also took place um, with some schools on, I mean, we all live on, in the, in the U.S., we all live on uh, native lands, um, but some parts of the country are still very evident that the culture um, persists, and there are schools, so we had a few schools involved where um, the sort of indigenous jewelry culture um, of America is present. And then, um, you know, it's, it's moved to different places. So I'm curious a little bit about, especially to anticipating what the project might be like in Brazil, or it's looking at moving, it's going to be in Scotland, um, maybe uh, Canada. So as it shifts to other countries, we know that in the United States, we have a high consumption rate mm -hmm. uh, in our sites. How you know we're encouraged to shop to work, you know work our way out of economic depression and so on. I'm not familiar um, with the purchasing habits of costume jewelry in other geographies. So I'm curious, you know, Adriano, as you're looking at bringing this project to Brazil. Do you think you'll get donations from the community? Is the is the is the purchasing trend of jewelry similar to the way that it is in the United States? Well, that's a great question. I think we will uh, we will we are all eager to find out. I, I bet it it's very different, uh, very very different. Uh, because of all the, the cultural differences and the habits and the, we are a uh, in developing country right so it's it's different but we are uh, I was seeing in the chat that people some people were saying that maybe some companies could donate and that's something I, I am pretty sure we will be able to 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 have and it's going to be interesting all these comparisons between the very developed project that you have there that you have been carrying for the last 10 years and that's a good basis for and that's why we wanted to bring this it's it here we have a lot of answers not many, a lot not i'm sorry we have a lot of questions not that much answers yeah um, and you also have, you know, where the, the rest of the world watches what's happening uh, in the Amazon and the jewelry trade significantly impacts deforestation and, and mercury pollution in, in the Amazon um, bioregion, of which Brazil holds the largest part. So in a way, I don't know, among the jewelry community in Brazil, are these conversations happening? you know, around the impact of the sourcing of your materials 
uh, relative to the environmental impact? Well, I am here because of that. It's been a, a while since I have been watching your webinars, what's happening all around. And I was kind of quiet on my corner here, a bit ashamed of the image Brazil has right now of burning the Amazon and how, the, how tragic it is. And definitely we are all looking into it. We are tr all trying to do our uh, to, to, to do our best to try and fight it. But as uh, you may know, we are, our market, it's very underdeveloped compared to the European market, to the um, North American market. The consumer here is not as educated as it is uh, in other countries where they want. So the sources, uh, the, the know your sources, the know your counterparts, it's not a, a big thing here yet. We have some jewelers working on this here and there, and uh, it's slowly catching up. And this is also one of the reasons it, motiv it motivated, I was motivated to bring the project into Brazil and to, to be able to, to follow as many good examples as we can find. That's how my, my way of trying and uh, spreading the word down here. And we, we are just starting. Yeah, hope to be able to, we are, to, to do as much more as we are uh, starting to. Yeah, what, um, what an honor to be part of the beginning of something. Um, we're here for you. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. The community is here for you um, to support um, kind of a responsible jewelry movement in Brazil from large scale to small independence. You know, there's, there's support. So um, uh, this project, um, definitely can be um, shared and broadcast in a way that you can bring light to the issues and offer a way to start to understand it at the same time. Um, so that's uh, very exciting. We are setting up a very large group here and uh, making, I'm using all my connections 30 years in jewelry, in the jewelry market. Here, down here in Brazil, and you can count on me to do that. So I want to go ahead and disclose with you, we have just posted the first uh, uh, images in our uh, Instagram page that we set up for Brazil. We have a great group here. If you can all go and follow, I will type the Instagram on, on, on the chat, on the Instagram address, and then please support us and we will start in, you will start to know all the group of nice people that we have here that are doing this. It's going to be my pleasure to connect everyone, you with everyone here in Brazil through our university and the group that we are putting up to do this work. Yeah, it's excellent. Um, well, again, thanks for joining today. Um, I want to uh, move the conversation um, to back to the project to understand a little bit more how it works. So I'm going to put the slides back on, and I'm hoping that you know one of the most successful um, projects in terms of sales of the end pieces, right, was the California project, um, and. Well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll put up the images and Susie, if you wanna talk a little bit about the, the economics of RJM. So, and also let's not quite go to the artist project yet, but the economics of the project and how there's, what's the cost sharing and then what happens with it at the end. And I'll share some more images for you all to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And it also has changed over the years as well. So um, the way the project works is um, I'll just do a really quick overview. So we put a, a call to action donation drive out into the regional community. We use now we use social media. We use word of mouth. We use the newspaper. We use NPR, the local NPR stations. And we get uh, we generally get about 100 pounds of donations at any at every um, 
installment. I think in California, for instance, though, I think that was uh, a lot more, if you'll remember, it really filled, our car was like floor to ceiling. Um, once we uh, get those donations, we sort them. Like I said, we go through every piece, every bag, we weigh it, we have a worksheet, we've developed a toolkit. So there's a worksheet in there and, and groups of um, artists work together. They're all volunteer. It's a, it's a volunteer situation. So again, in terms of um, economics, there's sweat equity, right? So there's a lot of volunteerism and we feel like it's an exchange, which I'll explain in a minute. But once things are sorted and categorized, we split up the donations based on their categories and send them out to the schools in the regions that are participating. Uh, professional artists come in, they can pick stuff or we uh, give them a bag of material based on what we know that their work is about, right? So like for instance, Curtis as a professional jeweler um, will put uh, some gold in there or you know something of, um, uh, that's uh, gonna yield, uh, you know, uh, a fine piece of jewelry perhaps. And then we'll also mix it in with plastic as you can see from <laughs> Curtis's work. So, um, and then the, the jewelers work with that material. We give them time, we give them space and, and there's ample material. So again, in, the, in terms of economics, they have as much material as they need in order to innovate designs with it, right? Like how much uh, for instance, I mean, right now I'm working in my studio and I'm just going through all of the ways that I might work with the thing that I'm working with and how many failures do I need? And so we design into the projects the the time for failure, the time to, let's say, I'm just going to use air quotes because I don't think it's a waste, but waste material, right? Like to um, not have success. and And that has to do with the difficulty of working with this material that has such a strong personality. So um, then we jury the work, meaning it has to be made with integrity. It has to be made with the values of the project. And we price it, we document it, we install it into an exhibition, and then the community comes and they purchase the pieces. Um, if they have a coupon, they, they get their discount and they take that piece home with them. And, and um, generally the exhibitions are very well attended, like from the first one to the last. I mean, we just like, just so hundreds and hundreds of people come to these exhibitions. Um, and as you can see up on the screen, the pieces are very, very different from each other. You know, like there's so much innovation in there. Um, and uh, we, we, we believe a few things. One is we supply the material and we, and, and we ask that the artists in exchange give us their creativity and time. So we'll supply the material and they get to make the work with it. Um, we ask that their work is a donation. We have done it differently in different situations where, um, an artist gets to keep a piece and donate a piece. I mean, it depends on the scenario and it depends on the collaboration at hand. So the collaborative group decides in many cases, right? But the majority of the projects we've done, the jewelers donate their time um, and their creativity and they give the piece to the project and we sell it. And then the proceeds are, uh, we do several things with them. The proceeds are split. Some of the money comes back to the project so that we can pay for all of the things, the infrastructure around the work, which is website, social media, um, research, sometimes travel. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we do with this money, but we also now have developed a system where we ask institutions if they're gonna keep a portion of the money that we leave a lasting legacy behind. So we leave scholarships so that the students and the artists can apply to continue the ideas that have been left in place at the school, right? Or at the institution. And um, those scholarships have been 
very successful as well, which is really exciting. Sometimes the galleries that host the exhibitions, they take a cut as well. So, you know, really transparently, the money gets spread across. It's, it's not, um, it feels very fair. Like we do it in a very consensus driven way. It's a very honest, open conversation, you know, but we do ask a portion of that money to come back to the project. I will say that, you know, that's really important to us. Um, and some of that money, oh, also I'll say a portion of that money also goes directly to ethical metalsmiths. And that's really important too, because they are our um, umbrella organization. Like we are the outreach arm of that organization. And so the funds have to be distributed and disseminated in order for all of us to continue the work that we're doing. Did that answer it for you? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm curious, um, Alix, uh, again, happy birthday. If you wouldn't mind unmuting um, and, you know, as executive director of EM, like how do you see, and you've participated in our jams, you've, you've helped host them um, at a really cool high school in San Diego, California. So how do you, um, you know, how do you look at the project from an organizational perspective that, you know, EM is about building a community of people um, to have some of these challenging conversations about our jewelry. So what role does RJM play in the organization? Um, and what's it been like for you kind of organizing one? So first of all, it's one of my favorite initiatives for all the reasons Susie and Kathleen were talking about. It's the, the hard news in the most beautiful, sentimental, I mean, jewelry is all about love and sentiment and all All of that beautiful blend. And I love how you called it the just, you know, morsel. Um, so, uh, and it's always been, it's probably when I was first getting involved with Ethical Metal Smiths, I would use RJM as the example of what we are. When people didn't really understand Ethical Metal Smiths, what's a metal smith? Well, you know, we're, we're out there, we're trying to educate, we're using, you know, community, we're a community and all that. So, Today, I see it as um, really continually one of the exemplary programs within the organization, even though the organization has um, had to uh, free the radical jewelry makeover sort of committee and portion of the organization, a great deal of liberty and independence it's, we still um, are pleased that Radical Jewelry Makeover is a part of Ethical Metalsmiths. Um, participating, I wanna say, you know, I, I'm part of a Rotary Club. When I made a very brief 10 minute presentation about Radical Jewelry Makeover, the relief and the excitement and that discovery and all that sentiment of, oh, that's what I can do. I wanna do good with this old stuff, you know, the beat from plastic to single gold earrings, you know, it became a relief for people to know that something good could happen from something they knew wasn't really trash, even though they didn't want it anymore. So, um, I, I hope and continue to aspire and motivate Radical Jewelry Makeover to also expand um, its reach, continue this incredible brand, but develop so that it is broader. Thank you, Brazil. Waha, that's so awesome. You know, it is an international possibility and it is all it's all the good feelings in the bad news you know um so uh to me it's a dream come true that uh you know it's growing and i am here to facilitate its growing and its introduction to various iterations small and large you know leak something you said made me think about this that I think the average person doesn't actually know what to do with the burden of this of stuff that they have, right? Like they, I, you know, we, we know the uh, general channels, like you can take it to the resale shop and donate it. 
but you could take it to a pawn shop or get you know the places that buy gold for cash the the return on that we know is really low like with rjm we give a really great return rate um i don't remember the percentage but it's really high because uh, we want it we want to show people that what they have has value you know and i i think that's one of the things that it is really important here is like that we are dealing with um, consumer waste in a sense. It's not, it's not a, a, from a company. It is stuff that each individual carries with them. Right. And, and it's, that to me is, is one of the interesting parts of the project, the variable of that, like, how do we show people that what they have has value and that they don't have to hoard it? Right. I mean, that's exactly. really a cultural thing. Right. And exactly. I mean, the relief I hear, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an insider. This is, this is part of me, but when I hear from others who have this stuff that they don't want anymore, they have a sense that it has value and you bring it to a resale shop and they're like, well, I can't sell that. And you know, what are you going to do with that? And you know what I mean? Like that, that moment of their, it represents their grandma's earring even though it's costume jewelry has no value to them it has value and then this is where it shows that yes there was labor that went into that it does have value even if it's plastic it has value when you re when you put it through a designer and uh and it can do good so it's both it itself has value and it can do good with that value you know that is like that makes people feel good so it's a feel-good project. There, there are, of course, some really practical questions coming up in the chat. How do I host one? How do I sign up on the list? How much time should I allow to organize such an event? You know, if I'm planning something like this, um, can I run it independently? Or, you know, like, do you need to be there? Or is it better if you're there? Those kinds of things. So if you could, um, Maybe I'll have Kathleen just start off, you know, with the, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Kathleen. The basics, right? With someone's approaching uh, Radical Jewelry Makeover, Ethical Metalsmith saying, you know, I wanna host one of these things. Um, what are some of the basic things that they need to do? So the first thing to do is to get access to our toolkit, which any member of, any institutional member of Ethical Metalsmiths have, has access to our toolkit. And from there, we can start planning your project. And I think the, the length of the project um, and the planning period can be variable, like up to, I would say it's nice to have uh, a year is maybe too much, but a handful of months at least to start planning so that we can gather community members who would like to participate. We can start looking for donation drop-off sites. We can uh, gain gather interest in the community and then start a donation drive, which a donation drive might last. I think the first one you guys had as, was it a week in Richmond that the first donation drive was? One month. One month. So yeah. generally the donation drive is a month. There's been some that are longer. I don't know that there's been some that are shorter, but a month is good, you know, let people go and get at it. And then sorting the materials happens between one to two days. And then it's off to the making period, which has been anywhere from a week to up to the length of a semester in a university. So three months, and then we get to jury the work, have an exhibition which I think the first exhibition was up for a handful of days, maybe? Was it a weekend? Yeah, a I weekend. I can't remember, was it a weekend? No, it was a, was it? I can't but it was, it was like a weekend or a, it was super fast and super like high energy. And then other exhibitions have been a month to six weeks. I feel like that's kind of standard now, um, but the key, I think the key range is the making period that the community gets to decide, you know, do you want this to be a fast paced workshop? Do you want to spend a longer time diving in and working with these materials to build more work, learn more, 
and get dive into it. Um, what were the rest of the questions? How we're always accepting donations, by the way, you can find the donation form on our website, you can mail it directly to us, uh, Susie and I in Richmond, which the address is on the donation form if there's not a project happening. Once there's a project happening, you can mail it directly to the project, but don't feel like you need a, a current donation drive happening to send us donations. We'll take it and we'll get it to that project. Um, yeah. You know what, I just want to jump in and just say Kathleen, uh, uh, what add to Kathleen's um, explanation. One of the things that we stress though is that, and this can be time dependent too, is that we want the exhibition to be in a professional space. We want it to be in a gallery. We want it to be um, someplace very visible. And so that can also uh, dictate the time duration because galleries have schedules that are, you know, more than a year out. And so sometimes when the conversation begins, we, you know, that's our first question. Well, where do you want the, the outcome? Where is the exhibition? And so those are really things to consider. And one of the reasons is that, you know, we were putting the artists, we're showcasing the artist's creativity and ingenuity, right? Their innovation. And it deserves recognition in a professional setting it deserves to be highlighted and honored and so we want to make sure that the work is in a gallery situation where it's going to be uh showcased in the most the best way you know I think and for students that sometimes means it's their first exhibition like kathleen was a beginner student that was your first show right and that that becomes this um punctuation in somebody's career that i think can't be underestimated and so that's really important to, to mention too. I think too, in the planning of things, it, it, we ask, I think it's better to have a lot of time on the front end before we even get to the donation period because of moving parts like that, right? Like making sure we have that professional exhibition space, making sure it fits in to the curriculum or whatever learning institution we're working with in the community. like all of these moving parts kind of fit together into a fluid project. Uh, there's a question from Laura uh, about oh. the donation drive. So all of the donations do not get used and it's impossible to use everything in one project. However, they all come back into the RJM stockpile which currently lives in my office. And we get to use those for other projects for to go to other maybe middle school and high schools in uh, different communities, uh, workshops around the country. And it leads into something we haven't talked about yet, but the RGM Artist Project that Susie started a couple of years ago. Do you wanna talk about that, Susie? Mm, yeah, I'll start and then you jump. Is that good? Because you're a, you're a member and, and Curtis is too. So it'd be fun to hear from both of you about your experiences. So a number of years ago, um, I started the artist project. It was out of curiosity. I mean, as, as an artist, don't we start things out of curiosity? So I guess that's kind of like the impulse here always is, is to find something out. And what I wanted to find out is, um, had the project impacted alumni, you know, from who had already participated. And so what I did is I reached out to um, a group of artists and asked them to dive more deeply into the project by creating a, a broader series of work that the project would then represent over time. Um, and so we also sent them a list of questions in order to create a, trans, a, a transparent conversation about what it means to have a wise studio practice. Like we, I wasn't looking for a right answer, but I was looking for really like, could this become a dialogue for um, questions, concerns, solutions, more questions that are, arise from the process. And so uh, all of that has been posted on the website. Each artist has a feature and, and the project has gone on 
to, to have exhibitions across the country. And um, what we do differently, so economically, this one is different. So uh, I'm pointing at Christina, I shouldn't, because you don't know that Christina is over here for me. Just to get back to that question, what we do with this project is we we do a 33-33-33 split, like a traditional gallery split in a sense. This is what we came up with that um, the artist gets 33%, the gallery gets 33% for repping the work, and then RJM gets 33%. And in a way, it's it's the exchange is we've taken the material concerns out of the um, artist's hands. Like they don't have to pay for the material. So we're hoping all of them agreed to this. So they all take this split. And, and the work is astoundingly exciting. Um, I, 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 it makes me curious to hear from Curtis and also from Kathleen about um, questions, concerns, outcomes, fun, challenges, all of the above. Like, is, is it worth it? Like, that, that's one of the questions I have not asked. So here I'm vulnerably asking very publicly. I think it it's worth it? totally <laughs> worth it. I, but I mean, obviously, like, I'm a little bit biased, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think something else that I love about the artist project that you said to me, Susie, is you were wondering, like, can RJM work be just as interesting and dynamic as other art jewelry that's out there, right? Like, can we make work that's worth viewing out of these materials? And I think if you go to the artist project pages, like, yes, the answer is absolutely. I mean, it's amazing things that are all different and all connected, I think, to the artists that are participating, right? Like my work looks totally different than Curtis's work. And yet we're all starting at the same spot, you know? And I was invited, you started the artist project in 2014 as an original cohort. And I was in grad school at the time and again, was a participant in my very early years as a student. And it had such a uh, impact on my practice and how I thought about my work that uh, it, the, the project had originally transformed how I saw everything, that a material can have a life before uh, it gets to me and how I might be able to take that story with me in my work. Um, I've gotten off topic just a little bit, but <laughs> um, Curtis, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, it has really changed my studio practice and the way I teach as well. And so it's totally worth it. It's been such an amazing experience to be part of. And one of the things, like Kathleen said, it really made me think about materials differently and um, help me educate uh, the people who look at my work about materials differently and help my students, uh, help educate my students about materials differently, where it's not necessarily the intrinsic value of the gold or the, the silver or the metals, but the quality of the materials and what those materials can do. So the, the color or the color of plastic or the reflective quality of plastic or the shape of something or, you know, finding different kinds of value within objects that are not um, necessarily traditionally cherished as jewelry objects. But um, this project definitely brings, brings that out. Um, my friend Deb Logier, who's participated in the project, she said that initially she was so intimidated by these wooden pieces and they had no value. And in the end, she ran, started to run out of them and they were like more valuable than any of the you know, traditionally valuable materials because the, there wasn't any more of them. And so it really gets, um, gets us thinking about like, what, what is value in, in a, a real deep way that is, that I hadn't really thought of um, quite so deep, deeply before. And uh, value can be a lot, of, a lot of different things, whether it be material value or uh, historic value or emotional value or, uh, color or form, you know, there's so it just opens up the conversation in really exciting ways. So it's definitely worth it. <laughs> you know, it makes me think about how how um, 
you know, when thinking about recycling, like, so in RJM, we value at the highest value, the gold and the silver and the, you know, precious gems. But hmm. this also brings up that idea of, you know, costume jewelry, like I can easily vilify costume jewelry. But what you just said about it is so important, because there is something to be learned. And also something to to make friends with that that environmental adversary that is also so vital to your practice right like that is that inspiring or you know like it's this thing to kind of balance out a little bit um which is interesting um yeah yeah because val value is really just a, a mirage you know we all mm -hmm value things because society deems it so. You know, we value a, a paper money, it's totally worthless, but we right. value that as a society. We value gold because it does have intrinsic value, but you know, if, if uh, plastic beads were as rare as gold, we might value that as well. And then culturally, you know, thinking about different cultures, we've really vilified certain things like beads, you know, or mm -hmm. not smart or, you know, uh, unimportant or in indigenous cultures and other practices, they're, you know, they are a commodity, they are important, they have intrinsic cultural value. So it's really, really interesting conversation that it brings up in a, um, in a kind of palatable way uh, mm -hmm. to bring these conversations to the forefront of people. Mm -hmm. I think too, when you're in the classroom, it's standing in front of the same costume jewelry pile with 10 different students and their eyes all go to something different that they want mm -hmm. and pull something out. Like, the idea of what they're valuing for their design or what they see in potential in this one thing that my, I might be oblivious to is kind of magical and speaks to the uniqueness of each artist too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I want to, you know, I know uh, there's the possibility that, you know, this video will, you know, the recording of this will be watched for others. And I, I, I want it to be noted um, that this way of thinking about what, what is created, what is put forward into the world and how it's used, um, this is not the conversation in this way that is happening you know, at, at the industrial scale of jewelry production, right? This is, mm -hmm. um, and, and it is on this basis that Ethical Metalsmiths, the organization was born, it was born out of artistic practice, right? And, and this curiosity and the questioning of these things that we just tend to accept in our lives without challenging whether or not they're true or helpful or serving in some kind of way. So um, it is, it's just one of the like absolute unique values of this community um, in helping to shape and guide and consider uh, some of the most important questions that we can put forward to um, a, 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 an industry that connects us to the entire world. Um, and the conversation that you all were just having right now really uh, exemplifies that. Um, I wanted to, uh, there are a few more questions that have been surfing, surfacing. One in particular, I'm not sure if we have the answer to, but Maggie, do you wanna ask your question about, you know, what happens? <clears throat> oh, sure. Yeah, no, um, it's, it's so interesting just to listen in in this conversation between you all. And um, along this line of uh, what you were just speaking to in terms of rethinking value, um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, this, you've had this transformation moment through working on this project and many of the people who have participated have transformed their thinking. And so for um, those of us who are working with fine jewelry, I guess I'm wondering what kind of lessons from RJM would you like the broader jewelry industry to know? Um, what lessons have you learned or ideas um, that have come up through doing RJM that you think could, should be shared with the broader jewelry industry? Um, rethinking value of materials is just one, seems like one example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard question. What a good, I, 
you know, I knew actually, Maggie, you would have one good hard question because I know that that <laughs> at least that, thanks. <laughs> That's OK if there's no answer, uh, specific answers, but um, it's just it's a fascinating project and it's clearly impacted um, your lives. And um, yeah, I think that there's a lot we can learn from just this uh, the practice of what you're doing generally. But um, as Christina was saying, you know, how can we take these concepts and maybe consider them in, in different ways of practicing jewelry? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, you know, the instantly, I, I have to say that my initial impulse for the project and my initial desire uh, to change things is, is still present where I wish, I don't know how to do this, but I wish somehow we uh, could inspire wanting or needing fewer things. <laughs> Let's just not have so much stuff. L why do we, I need a pair of earrings for every day of the year? I don't, right? Fewer, better things, as Glenn Adamson would say in his book. But I, you know, or like even thinking, I mean, you know, so there's so many different ways that I would think about it, you know, like, how do we inspire people to let go of things, you know, like even um, Alik said something very early on in the chat, I don't think I'll be able to find it. Um, you know, how, how do we inspire people to let go, right? Like, I, I, I don't have kids, so I'm not going to pass these earrings from my grandfather down to my kid, is it okay for them to be put back into the use pile? Like, how do we, we could do things differently. We could inspire culture to think differently about this is, I get to use these now, and then somebody else gets to use it later. It's a borrow. It is not an own. We don't own things, right? We use them for the duration. Like, what if we thought about things differently, right? Or like, what if, um, like the RGM Artist Project, what if the artist didn't pay for the materials that they used to make things? Like, what if I could endlessly supply Curtis and Kathleen with materials and they never had to buy materials again? All of these are different models, right? They're different. We, we could do things differently. And that is the one thing that I would wish we could. I, I've always wanted this. I know K Christina and I were like, this is going to take over the world. We're going to change everything. And I know that's like my ego is hitting you in the face right now. I'm really ashamed of myself. Um, I wish we could cut that from the recording. But, um, but it is true that like if we could think differently about the things we possess. We don't possess them, right? That would be my one dying wish, my one dying wish. I think, uh, not that I can top that or <laughs> do anything close to it, <laughs> but I think for me, instead of necessarily thinking directly about the industry, but just the community and people in general, like thinking about where did this come from? And not just the store it came from, but the materials, how did that come out of the ground? Where did that come from? I need to think about that. I need to know that. And then forward thinking, where is this going after I'm done with it? Right? Like, is this, can I, can I recycle this? Can I melt, melt, melt this down and turn it into something else? Is it going to, is it, gonna end up from my sister-in-law's jewelry box into the landfill like how can we stop that or interrupt that or even just change that thinking you know to bring more of a cradle to cradle system into the larger community mm -hmm. um, yeah I definitely agree with that it, it made me more conscious of the supply chain that we're all part of regardless if we're aware of it or not and how all of us are part of different supply chains, whether we're conscious of it or not, and just bringing that consciousness to it that we can help, you know, support that system <laughs> negatively or impact that um, in a small way to help prevent, um, to keep things in a smaller cycle. Adriano, is there a perspective you want to add? 
Yes, please. Very interesting. I'm observing the, the uh, Susie's perspective on her artistic wor work and how humble she is uh, by saying, well, the, my work is living with me. And, and then this is something I am observing. Uh, uh, one of the differences I will be observing uh, by bringing the project here is that uh, also responding to your questions about how different it will be. It's uh, because we are, will be running into a design school and uh, not an uh, industrial design school where we look at the jewel from a product point of view. So it's instead of uh, as a, the idea of the jewel is not, we, we take a step aside and look at it, not from an artistic point of view, where the value, it's sometimes more dear to the artist who made the jewel. And by looking at the jewel from a from a, a jeweler's point of view, we try and to uh, uh, to make it as value to a lot of people. So we are always we are always approaching the jewel from a cultural and social material from all points of view and to, and to, to try and to uh, uh, make it more uh, ap appealable. Uh, to the biggest cons consumer. And also one, so it, it has this different shift of point of view that will be interesting to go from one to the other. And the other thing is that when the, on the design perspective, we always, we always try and to look at the whole life cycle of the product. So it will be nice to be able to do this, this, these locations between different points of view and to try and see what holds more. Uh, not one is better than the other, right? Not, not, not anything like this. It's just that, it, that it's always nice to make these locations. We always nice to shift perspectives. So we, we sometimes come up with new solutions and uh, new uh, ideas, new ways to approach it. And, and that's my main, uh, Meg's question is very, very interesting because we, we always have this Meg's question about the, what will you do when you donate a jewelry to a Salvation Army? They, it, it, we have all these traditional ways of thinking and we keep on doing the same thing and expecting different results. Then, so this is something that, right? We always have to approach with a creative uh, approach, new things with a creative mindset, right? I am so excited for the Brazil project. <laughs> I just, yeah, I was just gonna say I think it's so it's so awesome to have artists in this role of applying your creativity to these sustainability challenges like we need all types involved in in going from what we're doing to something better and um, just the the creativity of artists is such an important part of that so thank you. I think um, so. One of the questions we have to wrap up because we only have uh, nine minutes left in our session. But one of the questions that we had entertained discussing today was um, closed loop systems, right? You know, like um, and and some brands are starting to explore this idea. You know, where they could create. Um, relationships around their pieces. And so for a design thinking exercise for Brazil, like um, how do you, how can you create, and this is different than refining and recycling as currently practiced. How do you create a loop of material that really does stay in the loop, right? It stays or, or it can, you know, it can stay in the loop uh, with the brand, or it could be a consortium of brands that are all using the same material um, in the sense that the customer has a long-term relationship with you and their designs. And so when they want that design refreshed, they could have you 
uh, repurpose it again. This is not an unknown concept to the bench jeweler, right, who readily and regularly melts down material and turns it to something else. Um, it's not um, an unknown process in the large scale when it comes to jewelry, right? The re recycling of gold has been happening forever, like it's part of the cycle. But it has not yet necessarily been carried out in a way where um, you can kind of get the flow going in an intentionally closed loop. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if that will, that will be an aspect of the considerations that, you know, a design school is considering around RJM. Um, one other piece, so um, the, the conversation on Recycled that we did on the living room session that was quite different than this one, um, we did in conjunction with initiatives in art and culture. And um, I were partnering, flipping it now, partnering with IAC on the other side. So on March 16th at 12.15, no, March 16th, can you tell I'm confused? May 26th, where am I? Like the year's already blown past. May 26th um, at 12.15 uh, New York time is when the next um, IAC uh, webinar is going to be. It's a loaded, um, I'm dropping the link in now, it's kind of a loaded powerhouse of people that we have this opportunity to ask questions to about um, recycling, about the relationship that mining, that recycling has with mining, right? Newly mined material, what are we trying to mitigate? And the speakers for that include um, representation from the LBMA, the London Market Bullion Association, which is, has major power in our industry governing uh, the way materials flow, what gets deemed as good. Um, so it will be interesting. And, and the LBMA has been really active in a lot of these conversations. So we'll get to hear from them. We'll get to hear from uh, Mark Hanna, kind of from a large scale purchasing perspective, um, how, how, how that works, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with that at such a large scale. Um, We'll hear from a, uh, a gentleman who has worked for several uh, international refiners um, in practice and in an advisory capacity to better understand refining. Um, Amy Boulanger, who is the head of the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance to again, help us there with mining. And then the State Department represented by Pamela Fierst Walsh. So what is the role of government and policy in terms of, um, you know, do we, why do we need government policy when it comes to recycled gold? There are definitely reasons uh, for that to be the case. And so she'll be able to um, speak to that. So I dropped the link in if you're um, interested in registering. And those are also recorded. You can register and then watch later if you're not available. Um, but Lisa, just give a wave. Uh, Lisa is the president um, of initiatives and cult arts and culture and kind of is managing this. So. Um, what we would love to do is uh, also give, capture this moment uh, with a wave. If you all wouldn't mind turning on your cameras so we can kind of say hello to each other. Um, it would be great to capture a screenshot of um, all of these lovely humans that make up the community. So if you wouldn't mind, Giving a wave, ready? <laughs> On the count of three, one, two, three. Don't close your eyes. And I'll do one more. Um, kind gestures, very good, thank you. Oh, there's some people on the next screen. Wait, I have to get the rest of you, keep waving. There's a second screen. <laughs> Family so photo much. before we all go <laughs> for yeah. the summer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, very huge thanks uh, to Susie. Yes. My dear friend. Thank um, you. This was super fun. To Kathleen. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge of the project. 
to Curtis. Thank, it's so good to see you after all these years. Thanks for joining. Adriano, you can tell you've got like all this emotional support behind you. We can't wait to, to help on this um, endeavor that you're embarking on. It's super exciting and uh, it's great to see you all. Any last words? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you all so much. I mean, thank you, Ethical Metalsmiths and uh, Christina and Susie and Kathleen and everybody for um, having me come here. And then also, thank you for changing my life, really. You know, Ethical Metalsmiths and RGM has really changed so much about my life and my studio practice. So thank you all. Wow. I, I want to echo that too. Thank you so much to everybody. And to quote Sarah Parker in the chat, RGM for life. <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> so uh, Susie and Kathleen and Curtis and Adriano, if you want to just stay on a moment after we um, send everyone else off, we're happy to just chat for a little bit longer, bring closure. Um, but to all of you, we'll see you in August. Yeah. On the next living room session. Bye.